All right. All right. We're live. We're live. Karn, Karn, thanks for hopping on today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, let's, let's uh, uh, I want to talk before we dive into cover and insurance and all, all that jazz. Uh, you were, you're from Toronto. Yep. You presumably moved to the U.S. at least semi-permanently. Um, you had a startup previous to cover. And then previous to that, you were in, uh, what did you do? MIT. In the, in the finance, finance department, department. What, give me your like pre-startup. <laughs> sure, yeah, um, I was a management consultant uh, out of undergrad. Uh, yeah, I did a, a grad degree in finance um, at MIT, and then uh, ended up being a consultant again for a little while. Um, you know, worked with some really really smart people, uh, but had the itch to venture off on my own and, and start a business, and so. At around year two of my second stint of being a, a management consultant, and this was specifically in financial services, I quit, um, you know, ended up sleeping on a friend's couch for six months, trying uh, a, a wide variety of different things and ultimately landing on, um, you know, an e-commerce marketplace that tried to predict what people wanted to buy based on how they interacted with uh, outfits and, um, and catalogs that, designers would upload to our platform. And that, that grew to about a million actives. Um, you know, StyleKick was featured in every country, you know, translated into 14 different languages. Uh, and it was a pretty cool experience, uh, not having built anything before to seeing something scale. Yeah. yeah. So, so was this something, was something you saw, saw in management, 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 management consulting, consulting where you said, no. hey, this is an <laughs> opportunity or? No, not at all. No, it was, it was kind of, um, you know, uh, you never really end up where you start. And so when we first started, I was pretty fascinated with using, um, you know, a connect sensor. So the thing you use to play dance, dance revolution, mm -hmm. it's like a web webcam and a depth sensor and myself and one of my high school friends who's still my co-founder today at cover, um, built a body scanner that we tried to work with the gap and, you know, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of retailers on to help transition, folks who are buying in store uh, to try to get them comfortable buying online back when, when that wasn't as comfortable a thing for folks to do. So we'd scan mm -hmm. people, uh, build a profile, uh, and ultimately try to make it easier for them to shop. That pivoted into a pure marketplace uh, where we had lookbookers and designers upload outfits um, and then make them shoppable and they would tag the, the attributes. And from there, we would try to learn what people would like to wear. Yeah. Mm. So what's the, so what's, what's the, your, what's in hindsight, hindsight what's, your what's your story about, story that, business? about that business? Was it too was early? It too early? Was, was it just, uh, I, I thought we grew up into mobile at a really good time, right? We, we, um, you know, this is pre shoppable Pinterest, pre shoppable Instagram. <clears throat> it was a, a unique point in time when Instagram was still scaling and you could, you know, pick up tens of thousands of new users a day, um, you know, using, uh, a, set of strategies as part of like a portfolio approach to growth that didn't require a huge amount of capital in the way that you do, you, you do need to fight it out today. Um, so I, I'm very thankful for the experience. I, I wish I had thought more deeply about what, uh, you know, Stockel could have become uh, because we, we couldn't operate that business off of pure affiliate income and kind of the scale that we were getting to. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at who the winners from, from that era ended up being, it looked like, you know, Poshmark, um, you know, folks like Glossier, folks who either went and started developing and building products of their own or facilitating commerce in, in a deeper way, um, mm. uh, you know, than, than we were, we were doing at the time. So, yeah. yeah. When you mentioned when you back mentioned then, that there was strategies that worked, that worked and today you have to fight it out. Is that, is that are you referring to like organic, organic partnerships, partnerships with influencers, influencers that today is just too high competitive? Yeah. Or what so, so you know, we, we certainly leveraged influencers early. This is before influencer agencies were a thing. Mm -hmm. We quite literally built scrapers to help identify folks who were picking up traction, um, you know, had high levels of engagement um, that, you know, corresponded to the type of content and material that, was resonating on the, on the style kick platform. And so we could have been an influencer agency. We worked with thousands of these folks, um, and, uh, drove a pretty meaningful amount of traffic. The, the other 
um, you know, things that have changed in the mobile context, uh, you know, ASO, so app store optimization, um, you know, was still in its infancy back then. And it was easy to, it was easier, uh, to rank, um, and, and be discoverable, um, in a way that is more difficult to do so now. Um, and because we were building really sexy products, um, they're getting, you know, quite a bit of attention, uh, you know, from, from this, this community, you know, Apple and Google were pretty happy to feature us, feature us pretty perpetually. Uh, mm. And so there was a point in time actually, when we were in YC that we had both style kick and cover, uh, featured on the front page of the U S app store simultaneously, which was kind of wild. Um, oh, so I didn't, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So style, so, so style, when style, style so, so Shopify, Shopify, presumably you're in the same location in Toronto, in Toronto area. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. Shopify ended up aqua hiring a company. Uh, yeah. so the, so the, our team joined them, uh, you know, the, the genesis of that was effectively, um, you know, we got to know the product team there, uh, and had some familiarity with Satish and Craig, who was a the chief product officer. And what we wanted to do is kind of pipe in, um, you know, the, via the shop, the Shopify products API, basically everything that was being made available, um, via Shopify merchants within their own discrete, um, you know, instance of Shopify, we wanted to be able to make indexable and searchable via, via style kick, which is, which is actually, um, you know, one of the reasons that we ended up joining Shopify was to build something like a, um, you know, a marketplace for Shopify merchants and that kind of, you know, after we left, it pivoted into a couple of things and ultimately manifested in into the shop app uh, in its current incarnation. Oh, is that right? Oh, is that right? That's, awesome. That's awesome. I didn't realize that. I use the shop app, or at least yeah. it uses me. It sends me notifications. Yeah, yeah it's, got, it's got the right viral hooks after post transaction, right? To get you, uh, <laughs> yeah, to get yeah, you yeah. the ecosystem. Yeah. The, the concept there is that you download this app and then it tells you uh, tracking using the publicly available or Shopify exclusively available tracking details. And then it posts you notifications. Yeah. So, so really arced away from, um, you know, a, a pure marketplace. So I think that might still be part of the roadmap. Um, unclear to me, but when we were there, we were primarily working on a marketplace and then we worked on a handful of other things. Um, you know, like Facebook met like Facebook at a time was, uh, really trying to build out messenger and drive a commerce narrative. It, it, it turns out that messaging is a great platform for support and post sale upsell. It's not mm -hmm. a great platform for origination of business, right? So once you've bought something from a Shopify merchant, you know, the experience can be very, very personal and tailored, but the, the actual act of selling the first thing is a little bit tougher. Yeah. Is that go is back that to the app store, app store optimization? optimization? Like you're not like going to just scroll through the app store and app download store apps the way you would on like somewhere else, the web. Yeah. Look, I, like, I mean, it, it's always a portfolio part. So we had some paid, paid initiatives and th those were more economic than we had influencer in initiatives. We had app store optimization. Um, we had, you know, the additional in like organic discovery from being featured and that was enough to get to pretty sizable. Um, and then everything else out of the app, you know, usually growth is product led, right? So you, you know, when you have people creating user generated content and sharing it and trying to sell things, you inevitably have these network effects that kick in uh, and you're able to draw in more users. Okay. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, didn't it didn't work, work as, as people, people, it didn't, it didn't turn, turn out as a, as a big, big company, or, company big or big acquisition and the, and the, the storyline story there, there or what you what took you from that experience was, was, was what? Was what? Like, uh, that we could build beautiful products, uh, and we could find millions of people to use them. And then wait, wait, that, I, I, the, yeah. So, so the, the primary lesson we got from there was going from not being able to build anything and having significant imposter syndrome about taking a step out of my comfort zone yeah, to yeah. now having, you know, having millions of people use your product at some point or another and understand the, like the, the nuance of, you know, how they flow, how they flow through their products, what, mm -hmm. what the, the right hooks are to be able to retain them, to get them to refer. So it was a, it was kind of like a master class in building consumer products for us. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. It's yeah. great. How important yeah. is, um, um, app store, app store rankings, rankings, rankings for cover? For cover? Um, minimally so actually, yeah. right? Like we, it, we, we still drive on the direct and we've got a, 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 like a hybrid approach to acquisition. We certainly have cover.com in our apps, but we build agency facing software too. So if you've ever walked into a local, um, it's starting to be this, this case, but if you've ever walked into a local, 
uh, insurance agent or called up a local insurance agent, there's a chance now that they're using cover software to be able to sell a cover policy or a related products. So, uh, you know, cover.com uh, makes up probably the minority of our traffic. We haven't really engaged in a, like a SEO for or heavy mm-hmm. strategy there, though that probably will manifest over time. Our mobile apps, um, you know, again, get featured routinely. They're really, really simple to use. They offer functionality that most insurance companies don't offer. You get a phone number to a dedicated rep that you can text at any given point in time. All of your servicing, um, you know, happens th- uh, through the app. It's a very high touch, mm. you know, uh, uh, feel for your, your insurance dollars. Um, and, you know, th- th- from a design perspective, very congruent with the type of stuff that we built uh, in high-end fashion, right? which is not something you would expect in insurance. Yeah, no, yeah, I wouldn't have no, guessed, no, but it makes sense. I mean, great consumer experience is great consumer experience. What, what's the, what's the, presumably you start without working through the agency distribution channel. What is the pitch? Like, okay, hey, Karen, uh, uh, I'm a selling insurance out of uh, Milwaukee. Like, what, what are you offering me? From their yeah, so so look, I mean, it's always a combination of fast, cheap, good. We're just trying to do all three, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so you can bind a policy through cover pretty trivially. Um, if we're not selling you a cover insurance policy, we own a national insurance agency, and so you don't really need to go anywhere else, right? We we will effectively work with um, you know the progressives, travels of the world, and in it without you having to call someone else or download another app or fill out another application, we'll get you the policy. Um, and then what what really shines for us is actually post-sale support, right? Like if you take a look at our reviews, um, folks love us because uh, we re- re- remove the cognitive overhead of having to perpetually shop. We're pretty proactive about letting you know when you know opportunities pop up for you to save money. Um, and we've been really, really good about you know, arcing the the consumer experience into something that's a little bit more like a, like a triple A esque, uh, you know, value proposition. So we have a pharmacy program for all of our, our users. Um, you know, we, we surface opportunities to save money in other ways. So if you bought an auto insurance policy, we could probably refi your vehicle and save you, you know, a significant amount of money. Um, if you've got an auto policy or something like that, we can move you into other lines of business kind of predicated on what your, your pro- the profile is of the customer. So if you're a homeowner, you probably want a home insurance policy and an umbrella policy, and it kind of becomes bespoke to the customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Okay, so if they're not using cover, a insurance agent would be using another piece of software that has a similar kind of offering? Yeah, so so a lot of, I mean, if you're using an insurance agent, and, you know, they're, they're good at their craft. They've been doing this for decades. Um, uh, the tooling available to insurance agents is pretty atrocious, right? So which is kind of why we started to build software for them. Um, but historically, you know, it would be over email, it would be phone calls during business hours, it'd be a phone call. And perhaps, you know, your agent is not at the office and another agent isn't authorized to work with you. There are a lot of like, um, you know, inherent frictions with the existing process that really are like pre-internet nearly. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, and so when you get a, you know, when you, when you get this fluid experience of being able to text somebody and it's your agent. Um, you know, they've got an instance where they can, uh, of, of cover in front of them that allows them to manage relationships across, you know, all of, all of their book. Uh, it's a, a different value proposition from a speed perspective and an ability to deliver value from a pricing perspective. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm, all right. I'm with you on that. Um, uh, all right. So the, you, so the you... other, the other thing, sorry, the other thing is like, uh, the, the mobile format actually allows us to capture quite a bit more information to underwrite. So if you, if you think about what insurance is, it's a risk selection business, right? Like you need to be very, very good at underwriting out risks that are driving up losses uh, in excess of the, 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 the pool on a, on a normalized basis. And so, you know, what we ask for are things like, um, hey, you can authenticate in via plaid in lieu of your credit if you're new to the country, right? Um, you can give us pictures and videos of the property that you want to insure. And that gives us significant comfort that it, it, you haven't been in a crash and buy. Um, basic UBI um, gives us a sense of what kind of driver you'll be. You know, uh, like there's, there's quite a bit there that ends up flowing into a decision to find a high quality pool of customers that allows us to lower our rates for that high quality pool of customers. 
Mm. Do you think of insurance, you think of insurance conceptually? conceptually? I mean, I find the, the concept fascinating because <laughs> it's uh, it's it's using, like you said, what what information is available about a person to predict their uh, normalized impact on the pool. So you're pulling in from from a business perspective. You want as much as possible, and presumably there's some indicators that long tail. Where if you knew, you know, five pieces of information, you could effectively. Uh, determine what this person's rate from me would be, and then, yeah. and then, if you knew thirty more pieces of information, it would be marginally improved upon that. Is that yeah more or less the case when you think about it? Yeah. So, so within within the confines of a regulatory regime that is is intended to protect the consumer, right? So you can't consume all information, um, but, and the regulator is going to look at the information that you consume through the lens of, hey, um, is this insurer ultimately, you know, making a fair decision, right? Uh, that is inher is inher inherently discriminatory as a first step. The second step is if they have made the right decision, are the insurer that is, um, are the rates that they're charging adequate for the risks that they're taking? Because if they are not adequate for the risks that they're taking, um, that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Like a, a, a pooled risk sharing. Because uh, so, you'll your your premiums won't be sufficient to cover your claims, and you're kind of out of business for everyone. Well, wouldn't that wouldn't naturally, that just, naturally be just be analogous, just be analogous, analogous to saying, to say, "Hey, if you, hey, if you sell, clothing, sell clothing, you know, you sell T-shirts, and the value of your T-shirt is, is seven dollars, and you're charging one hundred and fifty dollars, then you shouldn't be allowed to do business." Wouldn't there just be market competition? Like you offer cover, and it has extremely high rates. I come out with, you know, undercover, and it, it I sell it for like. Why wouldn't the Why would standard it? Yeah, market so, dynamics so for, apply? For a significant part of the population, insurance is a very price elastic product, right? Like there, there are certainly insurance companies that differentiate in an old school way on customer service. And, and Chubb would be a very good example of that, right? Like very white glove service, um, you know, there's a fire and earthquake. They've got teams out there. Um, the, the claims are paid almost immediately, but they end up charging double. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it, it comes down to, you know, what kind of segment of, of the population are you, um, you know, are you working with? And I think if, if you if you do take the, the view that there are a fair number of insurance lines of business that are commoditized, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be the price leader uh, that wins. And the price leader necessarily needs to be better at underwriting and risk segmentation than everyone else. Right. You think about it. The math is every risk has a price. You and I, yeah. in an efficient world, would have a price associated with the insurance that's efficient for us. The customers, on the other hand, are arbitrage seeking. You're looking for to, to minimize your price, typically speaking, as opposed to maximize on customer service. Um, and so there's kind of this natural tension that lends itself to many players trying to triangulate on what what the right you know point is along a regression that you should you should be at. Yeah. And, 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 and is your assumption, is your assumption there assumption that the insurance companies, insurance companies eventually, eventually have access to the same to data? The I mean, in, in this case, it seems like the mobile is a big part of the part business model. The business model. We're using mobile. Using we can mobile, pull in things easier, faster than we yeah. could. So, on so, so, I mean, Progressive is actually a pretty good example of this, right? They're the first ones, rightly or wrongly, to, uh, to have started using credit scores as, as predictive elements of, of, of their underwriting. Um, and it took maybe, you know, a decade before other insurance companies could kind of calibrate around starting to ingest this type of, type of information. To remember, most insurance companies are not technology companies at their core, right? Like you, you and I may think of these, these entities, banks and insurance companies as kind of glorified databases, but that is not what insurance companies mm -hmm. think of themselves as, right? Um, in the invest, the, the investment in, technology, um, you know, it tends to be uh, outsourced decision-making to management consultants, right? Uh, or, or uh, you know, insurance SaaS software companies that are accustomed to working with C-suites that are not technologically savvy. They, they're very technically interested and very smart people, but they didn't grow up in this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the lag time tends to be pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. As we yeah, see in banking see too, banking right? It's like right. It's you like, go to Chase.com and it's still pretty ugly. Like the experience, regardless how big they are. 
and yeah. like yeah. Novo banks Novo and banks. new web-based banks are just going to be better in so many different ways. So yeah, no, that's, that's a very valid point. Um, how do you think of the, this is one thing I think about in insurance is regulation reflects our, like you said, the concern for the consumer and, uh, particularly what seems to get highlighted is, uh, demographics of people, uh, being excluded in some way from an insurance product, sometimes for their location, race, I don't know if age is particularly sensitive, um, probably not as much. I mean, why, what are, what is that about? How do you draw the line of morality in insurance? How do you think about that? Yeah. I, I mean, the regular sets the baseline and ultimately yeah. it's a decision. It's a decision, um, you know, by the folks who are running the business, what they'll consider right at the end of the day. Um, and like every other business there's a broad spectrum of, of personalities and willingness to, you know, in, engage in particular things. We, you know, we try to endeavor to look at things, um, it, it, alternative data sources in the absence of information. Right. So if, you're a newcomer to the country and you don't have a credit score. It doesn't inherently make you a poor risk, right? Either mm -hmm. for a loan or for an insurance policy. There has to be some other proxy, um, you know, for you, uh, for us to ingest and arrive at a decision. And whether that's a, you know, a, a credit report from a, a foreign um, subsidiary of a, you know, credit bureau that that's acceptable. If it is, um, you know, demonstrated, uh, you know, ability. Uh, and, and willingness to ma manage your money. Like, you know, there, there are all sorts of proxies for these kinds of things that, um, that, ma that improve market access for folks who don't necessarily have it. Mm. Mm. Got it. Okay. Got so it. in okay. the case so of say, case of say, say it was legal, say it was to, legal collect to collect everything, everything about a person about that you could person possibly that know, possibly like hypothetically, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. where, where does that go wrong? Like where do people actually get, um, taken advantage of if they voluntarily opt into that data, you know, the offer. Yeah. The it, so, so the, the question here is about inclusiveness, right? Like if you have full resolution, um, I mean, full resolution into everything you would need to price somebody, even their um, DNA is never, it's never really going to happen as like a, as a practical matter, right? It's, it's not never really going to happen, but if it did happen, um, it would be inherently exclusionary, right? Like you, you would have a part of the population that drives outsized losses for, for the, the pool. And I think you just have to determine, you know, whether as a society or as a company, um, you know, what you want to do there. Right? Yeah. It's a trade. It's yeah. a trade off. Yeah. yeah Cause I, on yeah, some exactly. level, I some take a simple life. example, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. my, my wife and I are roughly the same age. I'm 11. No, I'm, I'm five months older than she is. Uh, when I go to get car insurance, uh, it would be different because I'm male, she's female. I'm going to I'm going to pay more. So they're saying men statistically are worse drivers, more likely to get into a crash than women, or maybe they drive more some, some factor there. Uh, yeah. So, 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 you know, that particular example, you know, there, there's, um, depending on the regulatory environment. So if you take a look at like Texas tends to be, um, you know, kind of evenly balanced between insurance friendly and consumer friendly, um, places like California, extraordinarily consumer friendly. I don't even think that at this point in time, um, you can differentiate your rates based on you know, whether you're male, female, or, or non-binary, non right? Um, and, and all that at the end of the day does is kind of s spreads the results. And the policy objective of a California Department of Insurance regulator is to improve overall access. Because if you're, you're spreading it, you're, you're making it possible for a greater proportion of folks to end up being insured. Um, now, whether whether that actually manifests, um, you know, in... in the real world is, is a question because you still have a huge proportion of folks who are underinsured or not insured at all. Um, but, you know, it is a strategy that's been employed to be able to do this. Yeah, because yeah, it seems yeah, to me seems like to you me can like, you can shave at it on the margins. But as soon as you say, you know, imagine imagine men and women are drastically different. Imagine it's, you know, men are twice as likely to get into a car crash than women. 
if you were to to average that out and say in California, you can't judge, an insurance company can't use gender or sex based uh, to calculate rates. Well, now, what if what if women now, which have to pay 50 percent more in their premiums, what if they opt out and just say, well, if I get into a car crash, it's statistically just worth it for me to just pay out of pocket and therefore I'm not going to get it. And then there's this like cascading effect that. You know, it applies yeah, to insurance across the board. I, I think that is, that's very true at the aggregate level, right? Like if it, you know, you're you're looking at pools of risk, and you see that, you know, hey, some characteristics are uh, really really driving up losses, and in in an isolated way, there's really no reason that a person, never mind an auto policy, but somebody's doing a thing that's in, that is incurring some risk. In a an optimal sense, yeah, they just don't do it anymore. As, as you just pointed out, they should opt themselves out. But at the individual level, right, we don't think of things that way. Um, like it, we don't think of ourselves as inherently risky or riskier than other folks. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, the impact that it has on the individual is very different from what it has in the pool. Yeah. 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 But it would still happen. It would still happen. To some, to some degree, right? To, I mean, to some degree, yeah. Yeah. So, to some degree. I mean, like, look, like if you... Um, you know, drove a taxi versus drove for Uber, right? Um, commercial auto insurance for taxi drivers is extremely high, right? Yeah. Um, or, or has historically has been extremely high. So like, you look at that and you're like, should I be a taxi driver or should I arb this and yeah. go be an Uber yeah. driver where I have a personal auto policy and Uber provides some sort of nominal cover in addition to that? And I don't have to worry about, you know, this $10,000 bill. Um, yeah. Know, every year. Yeah. Uh, yeah to, that's, to huge. that's huge. Yeah. yeah, that's huge. Cause yeah, it huge. seems to me Cause like the, the, the message to get out there for the benefit of all of us speaking almost selfishly is that it sounds nice to be consumer protective from a regulatory perspective in California. I can see how the political narrative can easily be, Hey, this is better for everyone. It's equal. And in fact, we're not going to allow insurance companies not only to, to not use gender. We're also just not not going to allow them to use age or where you lived because that can be used or even your eye color or anything about you, in fact. And so it has to be the same price for everybody. Like how, what do you think if that, this is on the other end of the spectrum, you know, full access to everybody, what would happen if hypothetically, of course, it were to go that far in, in terms of regulation? It just makes it harder to be profitable, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and ultimately, it reduces the supply, um, you know, of insurance because it's still, a, you, know, you can still move around. You can still write business in other states and other countries. Um, yeah. And if you're finding, if you're finding that, you know, the total effort required to underwrite, provision, and service the insurance, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Do you keep doing it? Right. Like you're not, you're not required to. Yeah. 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 Unless you get into Unless healthcare, get into healthcare right. right. Then, then there's yeah. mandates and things, but what, are, what but insurance what policies insurance now policies is cover? Now is I know cover is just about in every state. state. Um, um, do you want to talk yeah. about the so, structure of the company and service? Yeah, sure. So, so, I mean, we were, we, you know, we started off as a distribution business. So we were, when we launched out of Y Combinator, um, uh, you know, we didn't know anything about insurance and we did know a lot about building mobile apps and finding people to use them. Um, and so, uh, you know, we would have, uh, even during the first couple of weeks of YC, you know, we were featured as the best new app and tens of thousands of people coming in and, um, not knowing much about insurance, you know, we, we try to simplify the onboarding to be something akin to like, Hey, send us pictures and videos of the vehicles, homes, pets, jewelry, et cetera, that you want insured. And then, the scrappy YC founders that we were on the other end were uh, calling up uh, insurance agencies in like Idaho and Arkansas and, um, you know, uh, working with uh, insurance agents and insurance companies that start taking our customers. And, um, you know, that, that worked for a little while. It didn't really scale very well. Uh, and, and more jarringly, you know, we found that the, the experience that they were delivering, like this discontinuity and being able to reach out to people in real time, like, no software experience really supporting the experience at all. As soon as we handed, we handed off the customers, led us down the path of becoming an underwriting business so that we could kind of own more, um, you know, of the customer experience from, uh, you know, soup to nuts. And so today the, the current configuration of the business is, um, Hey, like we have a direct business, uh, and we have agency facing software. We have nearly 4,000 brick and mortar agencies that distribute for us, 
it'll probably be like 10,000 by the end of the year. Um, we build software that's elegant, easy to use both for agents and for consumers. Um, you know, they, they come in through the apps again, very consumer focused because we, we know that a customer needs to get insurance somewhere. We know that they don't want to hop around. Uh, and we know that there's a significant amount of cognitive overhead um, and feeling and feeling like you're missing out or not being able to get the value you deserve if you have to go from one place to another, right? Um, and so we'll underwrite a customer for cover and not everybody is a, a fit for cover insurance. And this is primarily auto and we're moving into home soon. Uh, if it is not a fit, uh, uh, again, you know, we know our customers want the best possible value for, for their dollars. And so we'll, we'll work with them to be able to find a provider that does. And so, um, you know, we own and operate a national insurance agency in the background that enables us to do that. And then for anyone that we do not are, are not able, um, you know, to, to find a policy, uh, we also work with with insurance companies that don't work with agents. Right. So the, the state farms of the world, the Geico's of the world will will, will offer up a, a, a you know, fully pre-filled referral to help you get a rate from them as well. So it, we, side, we genuinely side with the customer. We just want, we know that folks are going to look for the best possible value for themselves. We just fulfill that function and then do it programmatically on the back end, um, you know, as, uh, as renewals come up or, or life circumstances change. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, so, so there's that, um, you know, in, in most recent memory, we've been a very capital light business, right? Where we technically are an MGA, so managing general agent. We do everything except for take significant balance sheet risk. Um, and that's actually changed now too. So we, um, you know, we're probably the only insure tech, uh, uh, and you've probably seen the route in the public markets, like that does a really good job of underwriting, right? Like a, there, there's typically speaking like a, a lot of hand waving um, at, and, and, you know, the, the best way to judge an insurance company is ultimately on its financial results, right? It's loss ratio, uh, et cetera. Uh, if you're, if, if you're running and you've got a positive contribution to every policy, you're going concern and, and everyone should be happy because you're going to be around to pay claims. Um, for the most part, that hasn't been true, you know, of, of insure tax. They, for the most part, just underpriced the risks to accelerate gross and premium growth. Um, and then a, a variety of mechanisms kind of have just removed their ability to stop losing money, right? Which is why they've they've kind of been hammered. Um, but yeah, look, like we uh, we've, we were historic. Sorry, I kind of segued away. No, no, we were historically, <laughs> yeah, we were historically a a, a a capital light business in that you know we would originate the business, we'd write a price and underwrite the business, we service the business, and we work with reinsurers, which is insurance for insurance. Um, to to move ourselves to like a defined economics business, we we know what our seating commission is. If loss is coming too high or loss is coming below, um, you know that that kind of volatility is buffeted by using reinsurance partners, who are generally very sophisticated actors within the space. Um, we've been delivering an underwriting profit since our inception, um, and so we spun up a reinsurer of our own um, on, on on Cayman to be able to take a, uh, a meaningful part of the risk that we originate. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this, but uh, on top of that commercial reinsurer, we're actually building a protocol that enables third parties, the so third party investors, specifically crypto asset holders who can supply stable coins to supply stable coins and earn insurance premiums that are generated by cover, but also other insurance companies. Um, and so if you, you think about kind of, when you, when you operate a reinsurer and you do it in a, in a DeFi context, it actually looks a lot like uh, a lot like a decentralized Woods of London. So I'm happy to get as deep as you want into that, but yeah. uh, the, yeah. the, the crux of it is kind of, hey, we now, we now take risk, but we also allow others to take risk alongside of us. Yeah. Gotcha. And, gotcha. Um, and um, let me define the, let me define the, the words you use there words first. Used so uh, sure. uh, you uh, mentioned reinsurer re and uh, Cayman. And, uh, what, Cayman. What's, what, what's, what is that? Yeah. So, so, I mean, um, there are, you can domicile a reinsurer, uh, just about anywhere, right. Where, the, where insurance is sold. Uh, we, we looked at Bermuda and came in and we're looking at, at, um, regulatory environments where generally speaking, folks are more comfortable, um, uh, innovating and kind of, at, kind of at the edges of, of uh, what could be. Uh, and we found both of those, those regulators to be pretty accommodating. 
And so structurally, so structurally you would set, you up set up an office. Do you have to set up an office down there? To have I, so so we have um, we've got program managers that are on the island. Um, oh really? Uh, but oh, really? well, we don't we don't have any FTE, so we work yeah. with folks on that. Yeah. And uh, presumably, it's presumably relatively it's easy to just have a shell or a shell like a post office box post there, office and then box you're. There. I mean, you don't need a physical need a person, person there, do you, person. to open up a company? Uh, not not during COVID. Uh, I, yeah. I think at some point or another, I'm required to go to Cayman to do a an annual meeting. That's not that bad. Uh, <laughs> which, which I don't mind. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah that yeah. goes into the, yeah, the, goes the equation the, is better, equation. Than, uh, better than Antarctica. Yeah. So you set up so a, um, set up a, um, the business down yeah, there business for, for the purposes of, purposes of pre presumably, presumably, obviously, obviously, the U.S. regulations yeah. and regulations specifically around crypto. Is it more around crypto or insurance that you're concerned about? Um, it, it's actually both. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we're, the, the, comer the commercial reinsurer is still a U.S. tax paying entity. So above board there. What, what we're trying to construct are the rails that allow crypto assets to start to earn yield on real world risks, right? So there, there are examples of, uh, you know, purely crypto natives like Nexus Mutual and like, you know, Ether Risk and a couple of these things that are intended to provide cover for smart con contract exploits or the like. Um, and the distribution primarily comes from other protocols whenever a transaction is being conducted. What we're arguing, what I'm arguing here is you have a nearly trillion dollar reinsurance market. You have insurance companies, MGAs, and other reinsurers that are transacting um, uh, with with other pools of capital. They're effect, de facto acting as reinsurance um, via spreadsheets and Word documents. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the capital risk and capital and risk matching mechanism is pretty outdated. Right. Mm. Uh, what we've now got an opportunity to do is be significantly more transparent about some of these programs. Like, yeah, like cover will see 50 million in premium into a protocol um, that divvies up, uh, you know, that that cash uh, amongst folks who are, who are supplying or staking capital to back that risk. Right. And, and earning them a yield. But is that, you know, that's imminently extensible to every other line of business. Like, why not? you know, nuclear risk? Why not like the 10 next SpaceX flights? Why not Tesla's entire fleet or, or, uh, you know, securing the Golden Gate Bridge against, yeah. you know, earthquake uh, uh, risks? All that at some point or another is going to be processed through a, a protocol. And, and, the, and the reason that I believe that is you look at like the, even the history of, of insurance, and this is actually not all that different from banking. There are lots and lots of these you know, pre web three things called third party contributory databases, right? Like you look at Lexus Nexus, you look at Verisk, all these are uh, in, in a way permissioned uh, pooled resourcing that allows insurance companies and banks to find information on customers that's shared amongst all of them, right? Um, all we're arguing is that there's, there's a better piece of technology out there uh, that enables that, improves public transparency, uh, and also enables access to returns that are uncorrelated with the equities markets or the crypto markets, right? Mm. Um, you know, you, you, in effect, could be a, a insurance company in a minor way, right? Uh, and, and earn a passive yield as a result. At least provide the liquidity. Because re, 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 the idea of reinsurance is that uh, I, I'm, take, I'm doing the assessment of risk as an individual investor contributing, in this case, say, stable coins. No, so so the 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 closest analogy to kind of what we're up to is like a, is a decentralized Lloyd's of London, right? So Lloyd's of London is a marketplace, like a physical marketplace in London. Um, you have Lloyd's brokers who originate risk. They go work with the insurance companies and uh, other insurance companies, companies themselves that have risks they want to absolve uh, themselves of. Uh, other reinsurers they bring it to this marketplace where you know historically you've had these tables where. People will go around and be like, I, I like that deal. I'll take 10 percent. I'll take 20 percent until a quota share is filled out. And behind those underwriters who are you know, domain specific and have specialized knowledge are names, right, which today are, are um, uh, you know, uh, financial investors or financial institutions. Um, but historically had been high net worth individuals, right, that uh, had access to returns from 
a asset mm -hmm. class that nobody else had access to, right? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, if you're if you're thinking about how you democratize that and you broaden access and understanding, uh, I think DeFi is the yeah. exact exactly the right way to do it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in your yeah. case, say, so your say, case, say cover, say let's, cover, let's let's peg let's cover in the traditional cover, insurance, insurance bucket, which it is today, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it was, then was. your then means your of getting the capital getting to the capital fill the claims fill the comes claims. from investors, investors, right? You're investors, selling, right? You're selling, you're, you're selling, offering, offering, how is it, to, as a slight so tangent, how is it typically structured? Would you go out and raise a hundred million and then you're not trading that for equity in the business, you're trading that for what uh, well, well, dividends over time? So, so you're talking about the the risk capital that backs correct uh, backs yeah. the yeah. the insurance premiums. Uh, so for for us, we're actually following the Lloyd's example pretty closely, right? So you, in our context, you have liquidity providers that are in, in, uh, accredited retail investors and our financial institutions that go through KYC and AML. Uh, they're now earning a passive yield against an index of all the insurance programs that are on the protocol, right? And that's kind of like the the um, uh, behind the premiums that are generated, they're junior, right? So when you typically pay, uh, when you think about how insurance works, the cash sits there, you sell a policy, the premiums come in the door, and usually it's the premiums that are first out the door to pay the claims, right? The regulator is going to require you to reserve against outsized losses and under certain conditions. And that's that's kind of where the minimum, uh, you know, required capital or prescribed capital requirements come from. So, you know, it might be the case that, you know, on a $50 million deal, you need to reserve, I don't know, five or $10 million. Right? Okay. And, and so uh, not unlike fractional reserve banking, you end up with a levered return. Right. Um, uh, and, and that's an oversimplification in, in the context of a very large pool of capital where you diversify. But, you know, on a $50 million deal, if you end up in a, you know, you pay 45 million in claims and expenses, you only require to reserve 5 million, um, and you earn 5 million, that's pretty great. That's a, you know, sometimes it can turn out to be a really, really good deal. Yeah. In some, in some instances, because it's a volatile business, it's not so much a good deal. So in the case, say, so just to case, yeah. paint it simply, it'd be simply if you have uh, a hundred members uh, 100 as a part members, of your insurance policy, each one policy, is paying $1, one dollar per month, dollar, you're getting a hundred dollars per month in the door. And if and worst case, those worst members, case, those members um, you know, all had their cars, all, say it was car auto, all, all of them crashed their cars and, and it maxed out the policy. That's, that's what's generally referred to as like the, the limit. Yeah. The limits. Yeah. That would, I mean, yeah. that's never going to happen unless it's like an earthquake or a natural disaster. Co correct. In which case there are specific, you know, right. uh, like there are specific right. treaties for that. Right. But yes, you're right. The combined probability of a hundred in, in like, simultaneous events in the case they're not concentrated or correlated is very, very unlikely. Right. Right. Therefore you, you typically don't need to reserve to the limit, uh, which is like the, the maximum exposure. Right. Right. Uh, and, and which, so, is, which right. is where the inherent, le which is where the inherent leverage comes from. And, and you, as and a, you say you're running this insurance company, this you, insurance would company. To, you would need to enough to flow. You would need enough in the bank to make the, uh, total, to make the 5% or say $5 million. Well, well, um, so, sorry. So yeah, you, you would need to reserve capital as prescribed by the mm -hmm. regulator. And typically mm -hmm. speaking, um, when you have other insurance companies as kind of your customers, um, the the regulator may prescribe a minimum capital requirement, and generally that's it can be pretty pretty mm -hmm. good. Um, but if you're an insurance company or transacting with a reinsurer, you at the end of the day really do want to know that they're going to be able to pay the claims, and so you're you might require that the the, the collateralization of the reserving um, as a cedent is uh, you know, as a cedent looking at a reinsurer is a little bit above that too. Yeah, so there's additional surplus. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. All right, so That's now we exactly. we take that model and apply it into crypto, where where let's assume the safest scenario would be you say you're the you're cover and you say hey you want to insure San Francisco Bridge and you want people to be able to contribute to that insurance policy. So I put in a thousand dollars and that would be presumably unaccessible to me because you would meet you would unlike banking you can't just ask for crypto it has to be you have to have the keys to be able to get access to it if you as the company needed to pay out claims 
Is that generally how it works? So you have maybe $10 million you need to keep uh, control over in crypto? If, to, yeah. So, so if, we're talking, if we're talking explicitly about the most conservative case, right, mm -hmm. what, you, what you would want to do is you would want to collateralize to the limit, right? Mm -hmm. Like your, your, to, to, the totality of your exposure is what you would want to collateralize against. So there's no inherent leverage. And whoever is buying an insurance policy from you knows you can pay out because you've already kind of got the reserving to the, to, to the full limit, right? In, in practical terms, um, again, because of this, this diversification, if you've got a, like a broad variety of programs, the likelihood that you have complete losses on all of these programs is well take right? take take well, the yeah. bridge take yeah. like san francisco bridge like, if it does go out it's, it's probably going to go all out like if a plane hits it it's going to it's going to need a complete repair yeah but but if it, look like uh, the point of the reinsurer is like take the risk from the the golden gate bridge and then bundle it with risk from every other bridge on mm -hmm. earth right? mm -hmm. like uh, like it's not as if every bridge on earth, True. Uh, on True. earth is going to simultaneously collapse right uh, it, it, again, in an oversimplified sense, but that's the idea. So how do you think about, so as, think as the about company as organizing this, company would you put different classes, like, like I could invest in like bridge insurance, bridge or would you just say infrastructure? How do you draw lines around the, the things yeah, that aren't so, there? So the, the approach that we've got, and again, it's, it's, it, it's purposeful for getting something up and running, mm -hmm. right, is to focus in on short tail risks. So stuff that doesn't necessarily have to wait a very long time for the the claims to materialize. And a good example of that would be like workers' compensation mm -hmm. or, you know, like a, a cyber liability, potentially a cyber liability policy that kind of pegs itself to a certain point in time where you might be exposed. Um, and so a lot of, you know, the short tail stuff is property and, uh, and catastrophe related, right? So you earthquake happens or it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, you have a home insurance policy you know, something either happens during the term or it doesn't. Mm. You have an auto insurance policy. Something either happens during the term or it doesn't. And so there, there isn't, there aren't these like really long tail runoff liabilities that that are inherent in some lines of business. So we're thinking about bringing reinsurance to DeFi. The right path is probably focus on the short tail, uh, you know, the short tail stuff. Prove it out, um, and then as capital kind of comes into the protocol, and you have like the total value of lock continuing to, to climb very quickly, you can think about these long tail casualty lines of business. And, and then all of a sudden, the entire reinsurance market is kind of open up to you. And that's massive. Yeah, that's huge. Because yeah. it eventually mm -hmm. could encompass could encompass everything. Encompass. I mean, there's the idea that may, maybe yeah, we we don't maybe get insurance through insurance a, centralized a centralized pot of money. Pot and of instead, money. Everyone, instead, everyone, computationally, everyone computationally, holds some risk reward uh, exchange there. I mean, in that way, we're kind of like a, a giant interwebbed insurance collective, right? Yeah, look, like these, these economic activities, the fact that you have Golden Gate Bridge, like somebody is taking the risk that that thing won't be standing, you know, in like, I don't know, a hundred years, whatever it is. Um, uh, and you're right, if, it, if it's, on a, it's on a ledger, if the results are observable and readily queryable, um, you know, you have you have sophisticated actors on the protocol that can build the models, um, you know, and not just build the models, but put up the capital, put their money where their mouth is. Um, uh, I think you end up with a better outcome, right? Like you're you're going to end up reducing the overall cost of insurance, right? Like it, 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 if you increase the overall transparency and, and, and access in general. And, and wouldn't yeah. it wouldn't it eventually wouldn't it boil down to just who has access to has access the most valuable data? data again? It would be, you know, in the case of a bridge, it's different. But say it's, um, you know, uh, car insurance or something. If somehow that data has to pass into presumably, like ideally, you pass it into the network and everyone has equal access to data. But in reality, I imagine that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, I mean, we don't live in a world of perfect information, right? Um, and so a good example of that would be, hey, like there, there's a huge demand for cyber liability policies now, right? Like most businesses are, are, are picking these things up. They kind of, they kind of sense, but from a, a competency perspective, one, the data, the data is pretty sparse, right? Like the number of actual incurred events um, to be able to, you know, project off of is not massive. It's, it's certainly not anywhere near the realm of what you would see with auto insurance, right? Auto insurance is very low severity, but high frequency claims that resolve quickly into a predictable loss ratio. 
difficult to do that for for you know cyber liability or something like that. Mm. You could be a Norwegian, um, you know, oil company that's trying to insure your your offshore oil oil rigs. Like, how many of those are there? Right, there are a lot, but uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, how much data do you really have? Uh, and so sometimes it just comes down to like, hey, uh, it's it's not purely about the data. There's certainly professional judgment and and having a point of view and perspective and foresight matters as an underwriter. Right? Yeah, uh, and that that's kind of how you carve out you know, your reputation is one. Yeah. Um, all right. So when you uh, think of right, the, so business think of the business that you're establishing that you're in the Cayman Islands, that's going to facilitate this mechanism, this mechanism that allows in individuals, allows to, individuals contribute to contribute value, we'll call it stable value, coins, we'll it stable and, coins. And, and take on the risk of <laughs> Some asset. You, so you're asset. dividing up the dividing the pies up of risks. You're pies. saying this is going to be bridges, or this is going to be all infrastructure, all infrastructure, right? Yeah. So, right. so I I'm still kind of noodling on how a DAO could uh, could be used to, you know, prescribe what lines of business, um, you know, this thing writes. DeFi yeah. protocol is being is going to be governed broadly, and in an ideal world, there are other insurance sophisticated mm -hmm. actors and sophisticated mm -hmm. financial actors that are thinking about, um, you know, this, uh, because they have an economic incentive to do so. Um, it, you know, I just want, I just want to, uh, hark back to like the, the comment that you made about like kind of the pecking order, you know, those premiums, there was the, the liquidity that's coming in from, you know, crypto folks or other folks who are engaging the final piece in the, the interesting question, which is like a, I, I think is like an evolution, somewhat of a slight evolution in, in how protocols are being developed. Um, we're, we're stealing the idea from Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's of London has a central fund, right? Uh, the central fund is the ultimate capital backstop to the entire marketplace. So you have, you know, folks who, who are, um, you know, proprietors of their own, they've got their own syndicates, so they're their own underwriters, they've got capital supply, but if everything goes haywire, Lloyd's is still on the hook, right? Um, in Actually, that's really, really important. It, it's the it's the reason that Lloyd still exists, mm -hmm. you know, three hundred years later. It's because it allows for folks who don't necessarily have a five hundred million, billion, two billion dollar balance sheet to start to write business that they otherwise would never have been able to write because they can point to Lloyd's and say, "Hey, we're going to bootstrap off of a financial rating that this network has, um, and that that is going to be the the port of last call." For, for anything that we ultimately do, which is why I think, um, you know, a reinsurance protocol needs to get big quick, right? It, so it needs to get big quickly um, and it needs to have a significant enough amount of not just total value lock, but protocol capital itself that uh, that enables this kind of stuff to happen over time. Right? Mm. And, and so, you know, there's some stuff that we're inventing. And then there's some stuff that is really just like an evolutionary process over hundreds of years that's led that's led to a configuration that's stable and, and we should learn from, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and it ends up being a confluence of these things. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds I, like I agree with that. Yeah, and I think that's, I that, that has to be the right approach to it. Uh, learn from what it currently uh, exists. I also think the concept of the merging concept together, concept centralized and decentralized is going to be important. If it becomes completely, if it becomes completely, completely decentralized, decentralized, it's of course at the course vulnerability at the of voting yeah. and, and there's no, there's no ground to, to hold things in place, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see this also evolving yeah. to where it's a, it's, it's a marketplace in the sense, and maybe this is what you're referring to and I didn't quite understand it, but that people can come looking for insurance packages. So the people who own, you know, 150 boats in some business, they want insurance. They're coming here. They're, they're, they're offering all the value or all the information about what they want insurance on. And then there's like a, mm -hmm. a bidding system where the market kind of evaluates this and then there's a uh, evaluation period. And then if it hits a certain level of premium or a certain level of investor contribution, then the deal is the deal created is and otherwise it wouldn't be. Otherwise, so if I come, if I say I own a hundred boats, I'm part of this company that owns boats. We, we rent them out. We want insurance. Mm -hmm. I come on here. I, I submit a bunch of information. There's a 30 day evaluation period where people in the market can evaluate and they either contribute to the policy or they don't. And if they don't, then the, the, the deal dies. There's no insurance, but it has yeah. kind of like so a it's actually, policy. Yeah, it's, it's not that different from what happens at Lloyd's today, right? Like mm -hmm. You have Lloyd's agents in North America 
that will look at your 150 boats or 100 boats and be like, okay, well, I can't find a standard market or an insurance company in the United States that'll take that, but Lloyd's will probably take it. So they, they, they package it up uh, as, a, as a broker, they bring it to the marketplace. There's probably, you know, I think they have hundreds of syndicates. Syndicates are again, underwriters, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're specialization. Um, and uh, they'll use Lloyd's paper. The, the, they have an insurance set of insurance licenses that you can use to issue the policy. But then the capital and the underwriting is happening in the marketplace, right? So it's not all that different. The different, the the major difference is within this like frictioned process, you lose forty cents on every dollar uh, to pure expenses, right? So you're you're looking at combined ratios. Combined ratios are like the pure losses plus the expenses uh, uh, incurred to originate that business, underwrite that business, service that business, being north of a hundred percent. And you know, if you if you ask me candidly, I, I think, hey, that <laughs> there's probably pretty significant room for you know smart contracts to uh, to help shave away qu- quite a bit of, of that overhead. Um, you know, simple things like APIs from insurance companies with policyholder details that could propagate all the way to the underwriter don't exist, right? Like what you would otherwise see is a spreadsheet with that has and every time it changes hands the fidelity of information related to the risk you originally took diminishes right and we see this all the time at the end of the day you're 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 looking at you know very sparse data right um and and you're dealing with very very large dollars at, at some point or another that's going to change why is it that way it's just why is it that way it's just, just people aren't including it's just it, aren't including yeah it's, it's just what it is right like i think um no one, no one during the natural evolution of this market thought that, hey, like having consistent verifiable data at every step of the way from the origination of the policy to the ultimate risk bearer of the policy was a useful thing mm. uh, or even a technically feasible thing, which it is now. Got it. So do you see, uh, the, so do you uh, see uh, the underwriters, which the it sounds like the power of the, the, the market at the Lloyds of London is that they have a wide, they have an eclectic mix of underwriters with varying specialties. So you take it there and you'll find somebody that will insure boats. And those guys have a unique skill set that can easily be applicable to the decentralized approach, right? Their real value (laughs) doesn't matter whether it's on chain or off chain, it's assessing a business and then they just happen to fund it through stable coin as opposed to. Yeah. And and all of the machinery around it is intended to reduce costs and and reduce friction Mm. to get them to the, to, to the assessment of that risk. Right. Like that's, and, and, and to be fair, like Lloyd's of London and like a bunch of other reinsurers have tried these things like B3I. The, the problem is you get 60 guys, and women and, and folks in a room to discuss concepts like a blockchain ledger, it doesn't get anywhere very, very quickly, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it, like, it, 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 like it, the the educational, bur- like the, the burden is very high. And then um, a lot of these folks are going to think of this as a cost center, right? And at least initially, as opposed to a profit center, so they're less inclined to they're less inclined to engage. Um, and ultimately, you know, just hire somebody else that yeah. has the requisite yeah. knowledge to go and do the thing. Right? Yeah. How do you balance yeah. it? So you got this business cover is, I don't know, hundreds of millions, billions in valuation. Like it's a big project. Yeah. At this point. yeah no, look, I, I think um, they're, they're symbiotic, right? Like mm-hmm. we, I, I want um, uh, RE, which is a, the, the reinsurance marketplace, to be able to support multiple lines of business for cover. What's like it called? I, I think that's important. R E. Uh, so, uh, R E. Yeah. R E. What? Do you, what's the? Would it? Re, yeah. Would it be a separate domain? Yeah. Would it be a separate domain? Uh, probably. Is it? Re, is re. <laughs> dot com available? Uh, I think Zillow owns it. Ah, uh, you guys can yeah. get that. Yeah. You it would be nice though. Yeah, yeah. good one. Re. Yeah. Find another fancy domain. I think I think re would be harder to get than cover. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, does it make yeah. sense to pivot the whole business in this direction, or how do you think of the the model for profitability with with respect to cover? Or re? yeah, so so cover cover itself, it, it, you can think of as a syndicate, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're underwriters mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day. Um, we're building we're building machinery for us to be able to do this. It's easily generalizable. That's kind of uh, you know where my head is at with respect to this. It's supportive of the cover business, um, uh, but it is different. Mm. 
There's no question. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So what's your timeline? We're recording so this time- on March 22nd. <laughs> we'll release it sometime. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, some, some stuff's already on testnet. So yeah. we will, um, yeah, we'll get, we'll edge closer. I'm thinking probably within the quarter. Cool, man. Yeah. Cool. This has been, I swear, it was the been, fastest swear, conversation fastest that I've had. Conversation uh, I absolutely that, love everything uh, you're working on. We had a, a wide uh, range in conversation uh, range from morality of, morality of insurance to insurance your background to, uh, yeah. to obviously blockchain and applicability there. Anything else you want to throw out there? Um, places you write or tweet or obviously the domain is incredibly easy to find. I'm sure it covers all over the web. Yeah, look, if you found, um, especially like insurance and reinsurance folks that are, that are listening to this or folks that are good at quantifying risk, um, if if anything that I talked about today is of interest to you, just reach out to me. It's uh, karn at cover.com um, or you can find me at on you know LinkedIn or Twitter, it's just uh, at Karn Soroya. Cool, man. Well, congrats on all the progress well, and uh, progress. keep crushing it. I love what you're working on. Hope to have you back on someday. Yeah. We'll talk yeah. about it when you guys are ripping through the uh, decentralized yeah. protocol. Yeah, for sure. All right. For take sure. care, man. Thanks for the time. Take care.